from Ecuador, and I heard an Ecuador President Correa, he was taking 15% uh, of the profits of the old companies, and uh, and he reversed it and said, no, we want 85%, and you yeah. take the 15%, and half the corporations left the country, but the ones that stayed, they're still making profit on that 15%. Sure. You know, well, I think Latin America has a lot to show us right now. Uh, and, and whether it's Bolivia or Ecuador, about about where we should go on the royalty regime. Hmm. Every time one of these governments says, look, this is a public resource and we're actually going to charge you properly for it, hmm. you get all these companies threatening to leave or stop production. Yeah. Yeah. But first of all, it's a, and, but what I like is you get governments in Latin America say, okay, we'll do it ourselves. Yeah. Like these companies don't have a monopoly on knowing how to Mm -hmm. uh, extract these resources mm -hmm. and it's a finite resource mm -hmm. so if it doesn't all happen right now fine you know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. this is this should be about getting the price point right meaning what's the royalty rate where there there could well be a royalty rate that's quite mm -hmm. a bit higher where it should be mm -hmm. where you have less volume less production yeah. and but, collect, but a greater return to the public yeah, and collect the same or greater yeah and the Green Party believes that the first thing that we need to ensure is that people who are of low income are not unduly penalized by any of the changes that we make. Mm -hmm. In fact, we would raise the, um, the cutoff for taxation to ensure that nobody who is living in poverty is paying taxes. Seems silly, doesn't it, mm -hmm. that we would charge people. And then we would look at all of those fees that have that have been added as we've reduced taxes and say, okay, what, what is the, a good way to look at how we get the revenue from people? Now, the Green Party believes in taxes that are visible and that are based in activities that we think are harmful to society. So we support a carbon tax. We support a carbon tax that's at a much higher level than the current carbon tax. But the revenue from that carbon tax would be given back to the people so that they have choice about how they can reduce How their... is it going to be given to the people? Well, there are several ways it can be done. The, the way it's currently done is through income tax. So you could lower income tax. Lower income tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. way that you could approach it is by creating a dividend so that we collect the carbon tax and we give it back to people in the form of a dividend mm. so that they can then have that cash available mm. to assist them in trying to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions or the, or the things that, that are costly to them. Mm. So um, that's, that's one thing that we believe in. We also believe in consumption taxes. So when we're um, consuming things that are not contributing in a healthy way to our society, we support a tax on that. And again, uh, taxes are, those kinds of visible taxes are offset against other taxes so that the amount you pay in tax is about the same, but you pay it in a different way. And the way you pay it gives you more choice about how you live your life and gives you an opportunity to say, I want to make a positive contribution to our society and I'm going to do it in this way. I'm going to reduce the amount of unnecessary consumption I have. I'm going to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit as a family or as an individual. And there are all kinds of ways that you can do those things, but it gives you choice and it allows you to feel positive about the contributions you make to a better community. I hear that uh, corporate tax has decreased in the past 10 years, and, uh, and, and, and that is why we have, they say, that's why they, we have a uh, deficit. Do you agree with that? Well, corporate tax has decreased, not just in the last 10 years, but I think in the last 40 years we've been on this uh, trajectory that says if we lower taxes, we can make up the revenue that those taxes used to provide by growing our economy. Well, we've seen the failure of that. We now have a, a, a debt in British Columbia that's approaching $60 billion. 
And that debt has grown almost by half in the last 10 years. And that means that we have been living beyond our means for a very long period of time. Who is we? The province of British Columbia. We're accumulating debt because we don't have enough revenue to pay for what we're buying. And so uh, the Green Party believes that, that we ought not to be doing that because that debt at some time is going to be ha have to be repaid. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're, we're essentially taxing future generations. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, I think we would agree that corporate taxes are too low. But again, the Green Party might tax corporations differently than through income tax. Mm -hmm. We would tax pollution. Okay. We would tax carbon. Mm -hmm. And the bigger the industry and the more polluting the industry, the more they're going to have to pay because the, the greater harm they're doing to society. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned MSP premiums. I certain, it, our paper in last week did model a very, uh, a way in which you could get rid of MSP premiums. Because mm -hmm. we're the only province that has them. The only province in Canada. Repressive. What? The, the only province in Canada. Yeah. Really? Everyone. And uh, oh. and they're very regressive uh -huh. in terms of how they impact modest income families wow. and middle income families. And so, you know, that raises just over $2 billion a year. Mm -hmm. And so we modeled a way in which you take that $2 billion and shift it back over to the progressive income tax system mm -hmm. and raise the money that way. There's all kinds of possibilities. There's also all, the whole question of loopholes and deductions. Yeah. You know, for example, the RSP is a very regressive uh, in terms of who, make, who makes use of it is mostly the wealthy. Uh -huh. And yet uh -huh. it costs the federal government about $10 billion a year. Uh -huh. It costs the B.C. government half a billion dollars a year uh -huh. because your B.C. taxes are assessed after you calculate your federal taxable income. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we pay for the RSP as well. And we modeled some ways in which we could stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So you think that there is room there to negotiate new way of collecting taxes? The governments, uh, the new government, whoever is coming in power in May, could uh, could do some changes there if yeah. they have the political will. Well, there's there's two concerns there. One is that mm. relying more on income taxes means relying more on the more damaging type of taxes. So I, in mm. fact, if you're looking at it from a, uh, an economic efficiency perspective, mm -hmm. if you care about people's overall level yeah. uh, of, of living standards, you would do what, do well to, to, to mm -hmm. avoid relying more on income taxes. So that's actually a move in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, if you look at our competitiveness in BC, so how our income tax system compares to other jurisdictions, take Alberta, uh, for example, our ne the next door uh, province, mm. their top income tax rate is 10%. Uh, in BC, it's just under 15%. This is just the provincial rate. So our provincial top rate is actually uh, almost 50% higher than it is in our neighboring uh, jurisdiction. Mm. It has implications because if our tax rates are, are out of whack with our competitors, there is a risk that it's going to be more difficult to attract skilled workers in BC. So I think that the, the, the idea that we can simply increase taxes on, on upper income earners without any neg negative um, uh, economic impact is just not uh, theoretically or, or empirically sound. Mm -hmm. People will change their behaviors and it will negatively impact BC overall. Mm -hmm. So I hear you that uh, if uh, people in the higher income pay more taxes, they will uh, not come to BC, they will go to Alberta, so we lose that section of uh, skilled workers. Yeah, some of them will Some of them will stay. Of course, not everybody leaves just because of taxes, but again, in the economic research, it shows that people change their behavior. So some, mm -hmm. some of those wealthy earners will find uh, legal ways to reduce their tax burden. So they'll create uh, their, their, their tax planning techniques, they can hire tax accountants, uh, lawyers, uh, to help them minimize their tax burden. So this is, to, I guess the idea is to say that, to think that we can simply just increase taxes and not have a negative impact is just not in line with what the evidence says. And, and in fact, there's, there's, there's no reason for British Columbia to move in that direction. 
what is the need for for greater or higher income taxes? Uh, we don't have a, a revenue problem, and, and, and moving in that direction will not garner the same revenue or the revenues that the proponents will uh, expect. So why are we talking about moving in a very damaging direction? Back to the RSP. Mm -hmm. The, the law allows people to contribute uh, up to $22,000, a little more than $22,000 a year mm -hmm. to the RSP. Mm -hmm. Like, who who the heck has $22,000 a year to tuck Sick. away into an RSP? Mm -hmm. if, if we lowered the ceiling to $10,000 a year, mm -hmm. and you could do that on, on your tax forms electronically with the click of a button. You could mm -hmm. just say, well, in BC, we're only going to allow... 10, a maximum of ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But we ran the numbers on this. A little more than a hundred thousand British Columbians would be impacted by that. Mm -hmm. So very wealthy people who yeah. give more than ten thousand. Mm -hmm. But the savings to the province would be almost two hundred million dollars a year. You mean the income to the provincial coffers? Meaning, yeah, they would collect more because that deduction would be uh -huh. would be restricted. You said a hundred million? Almost two hundred million. Two hundred million. So, Sorry. for example, you could you could increase the post-secondary budget in this province by 10% with that much money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what's important to point out is that all taxes aren't equal. Um, mm -hmm. All taxes impose economic costs on society. Mm -hmm. If you impose a tax, it changes people's behavior. And, and all taxes can negatively influence an economy. But some taxes have a, a more negative impact than others. Mm -hmm. uh, the economic research is quite clear that the taxes on consumption are less damaging, significantly less damaging than taxes on production. So mm -hmm. taxes on people's income, taxes on, on business investment, um, taxes on capital gains, those taxes are more negative because they actually reduce the amount of output we get, they, they, they reduce our overall level of productivity, but taxes on consumption are, are not as damaging. So if I'm thinking back and I'm saying, okay, what's the best way to structure the tax system? Uh, what, one way I would suggest is to rely more on consumption taxes mm -hmm. and rely less on the less dam on the more damaging taxes, which are income taxes, corporate taxes, and, that, and those sorts of things. In 1995, the total personal income taxes, total of the personal income taxes paid by all Canadians to the federal government were $56 billion. The interest on the debt the federal government's debt for that year were $42 billion. In other words, it took 75% of all the federal personal income taxes. And uh, do you think that uh, BC should have a bank and do the same thing, create the money to lend for local projects, municipal projects? Um, I think that... Uh we, what we saw probably 30 or 40 years ago is a move away from the Bank of Canada. We, we essentially, as governments, said to the commercial banks, you can now hold this money, lend it to organizations like universities and schools and governments, and, governments, and we're going to pay you a huge amount of interest. Mm -hmm. And much of... Uh, the con well, the consequence of that is that we have a much bigger debt than we needed to have mm -hmm. if we had allowed the Bank of Canada to remain as the source of both the money and the obligation that we owe on the borrowing of that money. Mm -hmm. So I think that BC should explore having its own bank. Mm -hmm. Alberta has their own bank, mm -hmm. the Alberta Treasury Branch. And that bank could be used to assist municipalities in, in funding their infrastructure needs. Mm -hmm. It could be used for our students who are paying extraordinary amounts of debts 
to get a university education or a college education or a technical education. And um, I think that this would be something that could be very exciting for British Columbia to have its own bank. Great. So the Green Party would explore the idea of uh, uh, creating the money locally here in BC and lending it, perhaps a very low interest or no interest, because whatever interest it comes back would be a gain for uh, profit for the bank, which is owned by the province. So we're kind of paying from one pocket to the other pocket. <laughs> right. Wouldn't and it could be a win-win-win situation. The, the debt, uh, Canadian debt, apparently pays over $30 billion, uh, $35 billion a year in interest. And if they combine uh, the, the province, provincial uh, debts, it's more than $60 billion a year. Imagine what we could do with $60 billion a year and instead of paying the profits for the banks. In British Columbia, we pay over $7 million a day in interest yeah. on our debt. If we had that $7 million a day, that would pay for a lot of health care and education mm -hmm. and community needs. And that's the, the hidden consequence of this uh, belief that governments can be in debt, mm -hmm. is that we are paying for it now, and we will pay for it for the foreseeable future. And then our children and our grandchildren will be really the ones that have to pay it off. Yeah. Uh, how important is that, that, uh, that credit be created by banks? Well, uh, I wasn't quite prepared for a whole monetary uh, discussion here. I think it matters, but I also think we've given banks uh, too much allowance to create to create money. Um, you know, every every time someone makes a loan, they're creating money. Uh -huh. um, and it used to be that they had to hold some of that in reserves, which put a cap on how much credit the the banks could actually uh, create. Yeah. And we've removed all of those. And so we've given unlimited ability to banks to, to create money. And uh, and I think that's a mistake. So you, the Bank of Canada used to uh, have that ability to uh, lend money to provincial projects and uh, municipal projects and all that. Uh, do it you still think does. It, it just still... doesn't use it though, as much as it used to. Uh -huh. and, I mean, any time the Bank of Canada issues a treasury note, Mm -hmm. A bond, a federal bond, it too is creating money. Mm -hmm. But we don't use it as much as we could. That's right. Well, it, for example, when you think about provincial and municipal infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. not that long ago it was to be very common that uh, they would issue bonds to pay for those things. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we, we discourage that and we encourage them to form private, public private partnerships and things like that in order to finance those things. Um, and I think we would be well advised to go back to tr more traditional issuances of public bonds. Yeah, there's some uh, statistics that show that we pay about $35 billion a year in interest to the private banks for our, our debt. Th that money could be very well utilized in social services instead of paying to the private banks. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I think of the, I haven't looked at it in a few years, but the, the Bank of Canada holds, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the debt. Yep. And that could, it, it would be great if that was higher. Yeah. Changing, getting rid of the GST, getting rid of the provincial sales taxes, applying what we're calling a financial transaction tax. We can maintain the same level of government revenues. If the governments, provincial and federal, would bring this in tonight, tomorrow the cost of living of everybody in this province would drop, drop by at least 10%. Sounds ridiculous. How do you do it? You tax the big casino. The one on Howe Street here, I think it's Howe Street, Bay Street in Toronto. The billions and billions of dollars that are sloshing around every day, gambling on foreign exchange transactions and so on. A very, very small tax on them. And in the process, the 15% that you pay in GST and provincial sales tax will go down to one quarter of 1%. 
And there is a fellow from uh, Toronto, his name is uh, Jack Bidel. He wrote a book about uh, transaction tax. And he believes that if uh, the government would charge a fraction of a 1% to every transaction universally, not just the low transactions, but every transaction, if that is set up through the banks to collect a fraction of a 1%, then we wouldn't need any income tax or corporate tax or any other revenues because that would do a lot more money, would create a lot more revenues for the government. Have you heard about it? I have heard about that, and I've heard about it at the global and the national level, mm -hmm. that if we did a transaction tax on money, mm -hmm. on the exchange of money, mm -hmm. that we would, first of all, uh, prevent the fluctuations mm -hmm. that are so devastating to economies, and we could uh, also pay for the services that we want. We support that kind of taxation. We think it's a logical way to go. We think it's a healthy way to go. And um, that, that we need to be going in that direction. Because part of that speculation with money is causing untold harm to the global economy. And, and even worse, it's causing harm to the most vulnerable people on the planet. And you know, it's it's something that government should not be doing. Mm -hmm. They should be standing up for the most vulnerable people and saying, we're going to do it right. Mm -hmm. So the Green Party would explore the possibility of uh, bringing a transaction tax. Yes. Now, that really is a national and an international obligation. It's very hard, I think, for a province to say, we can impose a trans transaction tax ourselves, but I think that it's incumbent on the province to advocate for that with the federal government mm -hmm. who can make that decision on our behalf. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Pedro. And, and he thought that if, uh, if the transaction tax was a fraction of a 1% mm -hmm. universal to every transaction, we wouldn't need any um, personal income tax or MSPs, because it, it could collect a lot more. You're talking specifically about a financial transaction. Transaction tax, yeah. And the CCP has published a paper uh, looking at a bunch of options for financial transaction taxes. That's up on our webpage. It's ah. written a couple of years ago by Toby Sanger. And it can take many different forms. Ah. Uh, I think uh, we should be bringing in financial transaction taxes. Mm. The one that gets discussed most often the, the model of the Tobin tax would be an international tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, generally speaking, you probably can't do much at the provincial level. Mm. There's scope for international options and there's scope for national options. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think a province could do that much on a, on a financial well, transaction. Why not? Um, I just don't, because I don't think financial transactions operate at the provincial level enough um, you know they tend to be uh, and and the banks aren't regulated by the province okay uh, so, so it would have I, to I be federal it would have to come from the federal government yeah but oh, one of these okay. days I'd love to see that um, I think it has some appeal but I, but I also think there's some significant concerns so mm. again going back to the hierarchy of taxes mm -hmm. the least damaging form of taxation is sales tax. And mm -hmm. this is a, this is kind of a, a, a type of a sales tax, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that if the, if the transaction tax mm -hmm. applied to final sales, mm -hmm. then that's an efficient way of getting revenues. Okay. But if we're talking about levying a transaction tax when an entrepreneur purchases a piece of uh, machinery or equipment, mm -hmm. That the, the tax on that transaction is going to reduce the incentive for the entrepreneur mm. to go out and invest in, in, in new technologies, in new machines, and new equipment. And that's going to have a, a negative impact on the economy. Mm. So I think that there's some appeal, but, it, but it, what's critical is it depends on what types of transactions is the tax being levied on. Mm. If, it's, if it's on final sales... We already have a tax like that. That's mm -hmm. that's the HST, and, mm -hmm. and indeed, mm -hmm. this is an efficient type of tax. You're saying it would be only at the, at the final final step of uh, of production, if, whereas if, transaction if, tax if, would, if be, would be would be every step. So, and, but if it's 
a fraction of a 1%, it would uh, perhaps not change the amount because right now you pay 12% uh, 12% uh, HST, and uh, and uh, and you figure if it's one uh, percent, this this guy was talking about a fraction of one percent. So if it's a one percent, even if it goes through five six steps, you're still paying about six uh, percent, half of what uh, right now with HST is, is uh, we pay or businesses pay. So wouldn't it be an advantage for everyone? Well, it has some it has some appealing characteristics, but again, critically, what matters to me is what types of transactions is the tax being lev levied on. So, if it's mm. all transactions, mm. there is a risk that it can deter yeah. or make some type of productive activities more yeah. expensive. And I think yeah. that's that's when uh, there's a possible risk. But if it's mm. on transactions like final sales. All right. You know, then, then I'm, I think it's, I think it's more, uh, I think it's a, it's a more efficient, certainly more efficient way. But then again, we're talking about a sales tax. So it's, it's, it's very similar to that, yeah. or, or value added yeah. sales tax to be, to be more All precise. Right. Charles uh, Lundman, thank you very much for your time. Pedro, thank you for, uh, for having me on. All right. In, in terms of uh, recommendations, uh, like, uh, do you have any question to the to the politicians, the candidates? Uh, or some suggestions of uh, what uh, you would suggest that they they would uh, they should uh, legislate the finances of the province. Well, I think you know we're going to get a budget in a couple of weeks, uh -huh. in which the government's going to say they can't, they basically can't afford anything because they've committed to balancing the budget this this coming year. Mm. And this is a this is a make believe constraint. Mm. You know, first of all, they cut taxes by a huge amount. And we're all paying for that. Every time we look at an underfunded education system or inadequate special needs or inadequate corner services or every every news item, you know, the 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 the, the, the child advocate talking about inadequate child protection. This is the cost of tax cuts. Mm -hmm. We chose this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they also kind of artificially said they're going to balance the budget next year. Mm -hmm. So. I think, on the other hand, you've got the NDP, which, to their credit, is saying they would reverse some of the corporate income tax cuts, so they would re re go back to 12%, which is what they were back in 2008, mm -hmm. and uh, they are bringing back uh, corporate capital tax on, uh, on, on and that they would bring back the corporate capital tax on financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And you've heard the leader of the NDP muse that he thinks some upper income people should pay more, but he hasn't said what the income threshold should be, you know? Is it 100,000? Is it 150? Is it 200? Is it half a million? So uh, my, my main thing w to politicians would be to say, be bold. Be specific. We, 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 we've got big challenges mm -hmm. in health and education and seniors care, in in eliminating poverty and homelessness and tackling climate change, and it's going to take money. Mm -hmm. We should be frank with people about that, mm -hmm. and we should say, and we should be bold about how to how to raise the revenues that we need. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Seth, I'll uh, I'll pass that on to the politicians who want to talk to me in, uh, okay. this uh, this week. So thank you for your intervention, and uh, wish you well. Okay.